I'm Jim Lukanen, and I'm with the Gupta College of Science. And today we're here continuing with our series on faculty insights. And today we're interviewing Dr. Till Hannibuth, who's an associate professor in the Department of Marine Science. Dr. Hannibuth has done a, a lot of work in a variety of uh, subjects dealing with coastal geology. Uh, but today we're going to try to focus in on this very complex and very important issue of sea level rise. So how are you doing today, Dr. Hannibuth? Hey, wonderful. Thanks for having me here. How are you? I'm great. Let's just start with the, the most basic thing we can talk about to bring everybody up to speed about this subject of sea level. So how do scientists like yourself define sea level? And most importantly, I assume we have to measure it. So, so how do you measure sea level? So that, that already is a very good question. What is sea level? Um, sea level is um, basically the height of the ocean surface, but at a very particular place because it's not the, you know, all over or all, all along our coastlines at the same level. Um, so it's a, it's a local um, level we have to define there. And then, of course, we try to, you know, press it into a conventional datum, so a national datum which applies all along our coast, um, which is the NAV 88 um, datum here along the East Coast. Um, so what is sea level? Sea level is, an, is a, the average height of the ocean surface. Um, so this means without, you know, wind-blown waves, without the tides, but still we need to define it somehow. So average could mean it is really the average between lowest and highest. Um, it can be um, the lowest low water or high water or highest high water. So then we relate it to, to the tidal range. Um, so it's conventional. We here use the mean highest high water. Um, usually um, other people, other regions, other countries use a different definition. Um, yeah. And, and what is interesting, it, it, it changes over time. So we, we can measure it, we need to measure it. Um, the classical approach is to, to have tight gauges um, along the river mouth or along the ocean and measure it over years, over decades, and then we can you know, extract certain trends if sea level is over long term going up and down. So sea level is you know, like, like the difference between weather and climate, sea level is not just the ocean surface, but a long-term average signal. Um, and since about the 1990s, we also have very sophisticated, very sensitive um, satellites, which can really measure sea level changes, sea level height from, from the outer space. Um, there are also other other methods to, to approach um, this, the height of sea level, and we have to talk about this probably in a couple of minutes, which also, um, the height of sea level also includes the height of land level. Got it. So uh, I know you're from Germany, and uh, I, I assume since everybody around the world is interested in measuring sea level, I, I mean, I assume there must be some uniform an attempt to, to arrive at uniformity in how we go about measuring this. Is that true? Um, yes, basically, yes. So the methods are always the same, but it depends on the, the questions, the interests, um, you know, of the scientists or of the governments, so the societies, and also the budget. Um, a tight gauge is a different budget than, than a satellite. Sure. Um, and we need to differentiate, that, that is a, a very important first step, differentiate between uh, sea level changes which go on all over the, our planet, so this is what we call the global sea level change, and then any little region, small region, small location has an, an individual signal. Um, so we need to differentiate between, you know, if we want to know how sea level is globally rising, um, and what these dynamics are and what these mechanisms are which drive um, a, a change in sea level at global scale. And then the local components, which are much more tricky. And then it really depends on, you know, the, mainly the economical interest. If you have a big city and a big harbor in such a, 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 such a stretch of the coastline, or if it's just, you know, pristine and uh, we let the marshes grow. 
from your perspective, probably sea level is a very fascinating academic subject, but let's be clear, sea level has some real impacts as far as humans living at the coast are concerned. Um, and so if you're somebody living at the coast, like you and I are, why is it important to be informed about sea level change? So um, if we talk about sea level and the coastline, I, I think, you know, we don't want to define coastline as just the line of the beach, um, but the coastline is a really wide zone. So with maybe some barrier islands, with the marshes, with the coastal wetlands, um, then it goes into the river. So we, we basically need to include the, the entire coastal lowlands and wetlands because their water level is related to, to the sea level. It's, okay. you know, it's directly connected to each other. So this means if I, if I live, whether I live you know, close to the coastline, um, like many people love here uh, along you know, Grand Strand, or if I live a little bit further inland, but still in the lowlands, um, the effects will be pretty, pretty much the same. So if we want to be informed and, you know, and use the information to be prepared for what is coming up and maybe prepare or respond to what's going on, um, the only real way is to have scientific, a scientific database. Um, this cannot be just you know, measured within a, a year or so, but it, it requires a, a, a major effort. Um, but um, this is the only way to really make in, informed decisions, um, to create awareness, um, because there are a lot of hazards coming with the rising sea level. Um, but also to my experience, the more informed a, you know, um, a society is, um, the more you know, the decision makers are willing and able to include this, this kind of background into their decisions. Sure. sure. And, and of course, one, one of the fundamental problems with sea level rise is it's a, it's a, it's a very s small increment on the, over the short term, you know, which, which many people just can't get their heads wrapped around such a small thing. You know, uh, the humans are, are sort of geared to, to, Focusing in on big sudden changes in sea level is one of those very slow incremental things that make, makes it difficult for people to, to sort of get their uh, heads around it. Um, that, that is absolutely correct, unless you live at an elevation, so at a height on land, which is just at the critical level, what we call a threshold. And I think this is what we see all around our area, for instance, uh, around Winger Bay and Georgetown at this stage, that... Uh, you know, the, the locals tell you kind of anecdotally um, that over the past five years, suddenly the backyard started to be flooded frequently yeah. due to the tides. And then, of course, it's our job to find out, is this just a subjective feeling um, or is it, is it true? Is something really happening there? And is this related to sea level rise? Is it related maybe to... Um, not the best management practices or use practices for our, our lowlands here. Um, so it could be a variety of reasons why suddenly flooding happens. But for our region, I, I can tell you what our data, what our student projects have shown in recent, over the past one, one two years. Um, we are right at the stage where Charleston, for instance, was a couple of years ago. So that daily tide driven flooding plays more and more significant role mm -hmm. has influence on our daily life so these so these same humans that are living here um many people think those same humans are having some effect on this sea level change so you know i i remember the discussion from the 1990s 80s where the data foundation was pretty clear but not fully accepted i think nowadays we exactly know what's going on um and we know that sea level rises, the, the data speak a very clear language because of human activity. It's not, we are out of a climatic cyclicity or so by far. And um, there, there are these two components. One is what we do locally here to our coastlines, how we modify it, change it, hardening it, um, convert it. Um, the other is the global component. And I personally, as a scientist, would say it is hard to separate this because it all boils down to our personal daily behavior. Um, so the global component, man-made, is definitely that we are heating up the planet um, by the, the CO2 emissions. 
and other uh, greenhouse gases. So there is no doubt about it. That, uh, there can't be a, a real serious discussion about uh, this fact anymore. Um, and there's a delay. So what we blow into the atmosphere nowadays uh, will rise sea level for a couple of hundreds of years and probably kick in, you know, in a few decades. So there is a delay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is this is a little bit, you know, vague and, um, you know, not really measurable for each of us in the day in daily life. I agree with you. Um, but still, I think there's a big responsibility of the, at the front end for anyone, for any society, any county to reduce the emissions, because this is the only way to do it at this stage, at least. Um, no, at the back end, we also interact with our land surface a lot. Just look around in South Carolina with all these thousands, probably, of new neighborhoods. Um, our tendency to convert our um, wetlands into, you know, urbanized areas um, to control water flow and so on uh, contributes a lot to, you know, local changes in sea level. Sure. And uh, so I know you're a geologist and you probably don't even like to talk about things happening on one or 10 or 100 years. So um, people always talk about, well, these things have always varied in the past. Um, and, and, and so can you talk a little bit about what some of the natural causes of sea level change might have been way in the past? Yeah, so, um, yeah. And when I say natural, I mean the things not associated with people. I, I fully understand. And you're right. I mean, I started to work on sea level, you know, over timescales of tens of thousands of years. Um, but since this matter is so, so urgent for our societies and our environment, um, we really start at records, started to look at records from 1000 years to just a few years or decades. So um, I, I, I really decided to shift my focus a little bit. So yes, it is absolutely right. Sea level was never stable on geological times, over geological time scales, but also over historic time scales. It was never stable because there are a number of natural drivers, mechanisms changing sea level. Um, the most, the best known um, um, is of course the, the you know, the, the difference between a glacial world, so ice-covered ice world um, with large ice sheets on both poles. Um, this ice bound so much water from the ocean through the atmospheric precipitation cycle and so on, um, that sea level was significantly lower during the last ice age. This was 20,000 years ago, and sea level was about 450 feet lower than today. So that was a different world. Um, if we go back to the last greenhouse world, which was about 125,000 years ago, sea level was probably about five meters higher, so 15 feet higher than today. And in between, there were a lot of fluctuations, um, you know, at a scale of um, several tens of feet. So this happens all the time. However, um, and there are other, on lo very long time scales, you know, tectonics can play a big role, for instance, plate tectonics. Sure. Um, so probably we don't want to dive into this because this is really hardly, I mean, we can't, can't feel that at all if we are on about our beaches. But what is amazing and really interesting and also alarming, I think, is um, that we exactly know um, the CO2 level in the atmosphere, the temperature of the atmosphere, and sea level, they are directly connected to each other. And we can well reconstruct CO2 levels in the atmosphere way back into the geological history. And we clearly can say, at least over the past three million years, CO2 level was never as high as it has evolved, has changed um, over the past 80 to 100 years. So there is a new component which dr seems to drive us into a situation which is, which was at least not the case over several million years. And, and that is something very specific. And, and of course, a lot of people are interested in right here where they live. Um, and you've talked about historical changes in sea level. I assume that right here where we live on the coast of South Carolina, these dramatic changes in sea level have occurred here also. Is that, is that true? 
maybe even more. Um, just we got a couple of data in from a, a student project of mine. Um, she looked over. She, she looked at sea level changes over the past 100 years. So we used uh, we used old um, tie, handwritten tide gate records from um, the, the end of the 18, uh, 19th century and 1905. And it was it's very clear that sea level rose in our area by about maybe 22 inches over 100 years. Mm -hmm. It sounds significant. If we compare this to global sea level rise over the same interval, um, there was about three inches. So there's a major local component. If we compare um, these results with um, the well-known record from Charleston and Wilmington, our sea level here in our region is rising faster, even faster than in Charleston. Really? So we, as the scientists have to ask, you know, why is this the case? to inform the people living here uh, just better and better informed. So now, now we have to talk about something which uh, kicks in on local scale. And uh, this is mainly two components. One component is that the ocean height, so the height of this, the ocean level here, changes over time. Um, this is related to, for instance, rainfall. If there's a lot of rainfall over a year or over a decade, also, our coastal ocean will be a little higher. If it's pretty dry for a longer period of time, our ocean sea surface will sink a little bit. Um, just recently, there was a study coming out saying, you know, we, we know glow, um, the, the Gulf Stream is sometimes a little closer to the coastline and sometimes a little bit farther away. The closer it is, the higher the sea level is. Um, it seems that climate change and now it's again a human component, will weaken, will lead to a weakening of the Gulf Stream, which means the Gulf Stream will spread out a little bit. This means sea level will rise at, along our coast. So this is the ocean component, um, but there's a very direct impact also by humans, and this is land lowering. Um, nowhere on our planet, the land surface is stable. It's always moving a little bit by, by nature, natural processes, plenty of them. It's particularly uh, um, true for coastal lowlands because they are, as you know, they are soft, they are full of water, they are spongy. So there's a lot of um, opportunity to compress them. Sure. For instance, extracting water and um, compressing means land surface will sink. Mm -hmm. Um, of course, there are also natural tectonic and this kind of components leading to vertical land motion. But if we um, drain our wetlands, we will extract the water. So it's a loss in volume. If we add new developments, filling the wetlands in with dirt, um, this will lower the surface overall. Um, if we extract groundwater more than naturally will be recharged, we lose volume there, this will lead to land lowering. So you see, whatever I mentioned, uh, it will not gain land level, but it will lead to a lowering, a sinking of, of land level. And we think that is a very important component here in our coastal, northern, northern coastal South Carolina, but there are no data on this. So um, this is one big effort for, for the near future to work on. And then, of course, we play with the water a lot. So embankments of rivers, um, embankments of former wetlands, you know, doesn't allow the water to spread out anymore. So locally, this will lift the water level along the rivers upward. As I said, we started out with a pretty simple idea, and, uh, and you've shown us just how complex this problem is, but um, how important it may be in the future. So... Uh, Thank you very much for giving us these insights and uh, appreciate you talking. Well, it was a pleasure be, to be here. It was a pleasure to, to have this conversation with you. And uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. Okay, great. Thank you very much.